because I want to talk with you about this fivefold living. Now, as I was talking about the prophetic here just a moment ago, somebody said that God wants everybody to learn to hear God. God wants all believers to have that kind of connection with God that we can kind of discern what God wants for us, right? How many of you would agree that that's true? Let me read a passage that definitely confirms that. It said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Okay? Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Listen, God wants everybody to learn to hear God. Now listen, not everybody's a prophet, but all believers can be prophetic people. All believers can learn to hear what God is speaking to them. Now there's a lot of reasons why we don't, because maybe we think God's voice is going to be this big, thunderous, booming voice. How many of you found out it's most always not like that? You're expecting the voice of God to somehow part your hair, and it's like, whoa, that's God talking right there. Or, the, you know, a finger, like with Daniel, a finger's going to start writing on the wall, and you're like, there's God right there. And so we kind of have this preconceived notion of what it's going to look like. There's going to be lightning bolts. There's going to be a booming voice. There's going to be a fire from heaven. And so when we don't see that, we go, oh, it can't be God. But God often speaks to us in such ordinary ways that it's quite possible that we don't even recognize that it was God speaking to us. We think, oh, it was the pizza. But can I just tell you, it might not be just the pizza, right? It might be God speaking to you. Another reason we don't hear him is because our spiritual ears get plugged up. Now, now the place where God has spoken to us more clearly is where? The Bible. And so he, he tells us what we should be doing in the Bible. And what happens when we ignore what God has already said, what happens is pretty soon our heart gets hard, our spiritual ears get plugged, because we're, you know, we're kind of tuning out what God has already said. So then God comes and he wants to speak to you, but we don't hear him because we've plugged up our hearts, we've plugged up our ears. But as we talked about that particular week, that it just takes a moment to confess your sin to God for him to purify you from all unrighteousness and to restore contact and communication between you and the Lord. Now, we talked about many of the ways that God speaks to us. The most obvious way that he speaks is through the Bible. So if you want to hear uh, God, you're never going to hear him more clearly than what he says in the Bible. How many of you know there's a reason why we call the Bible the Bible? Word of God, because it is. It's where God has spoken to us. It's the word of God. We talked about how God speaks to us through the inner hunch. Have you just ever had an impression? Maybe you were talking with somebody and, and just something inside of you is like, eh, this, they're not telling me the whole story here. Anybody of you ever had that before? Uh, or maybe you just had that sense it's like you shouldn't go somewhere. Or you shouldn't go do something. How many of you have ever had that impression before? Okay. I call that the inner hunch. God will speak to us with those those inner impressions like that. He speaks to us through the prophetic word. God speaks to us through circumstances. As he said here in uh, in Acts, he speaks to us through dreams. He speaks to us uh, through visions. Listen, not Everybody is a prophet, but all Christians can be prophetic people. Amen. He didn't say on some, I will pour out my spirit. He said on all, on men and women, I will pour out my spirit on servants, on all of them. God wants to speak to all of us. Now, obviously, we have people in our church that they don't run around saying I'm a prophet. But they certainly operate at a high level of prophetic giftedness, okay? And you may think, oh, gee, they hear God. I'm going to run to Steve. I'm going to run to Sherry. 
I'm going to run and say, what's God telling me? Well, time out for a moment. It says that a, pro- a prophet's job is to prepare the body for works of service. You know what those gifted prophetic people will do? They'll pray with, with you. Then they'll encourage you. Why don't you get before God? Why don't you listen? See what God is saying to you. Then come back and share that. And we can confirm together what God is saying. It's not the prophet's job to sit there telling everybody this is what God wants you to do. When God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all of you. Amen. So that's one right there. God wants us to be a prophetic people. I said prophetic, not pathetic. Amen. Okay. And then here's the next thing. All believers have been apostolically commissioned by Jesus. Now, uh, the word apostle means one who has been sent out. Now, are all of us apostles? No, of course not. We are not all apostles. But we have all been apostolically commissioned by Jesus to go. Look what it says in Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Where are you going? Where are you going? Well, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. You going to Burgerville? Okay, go make disciples there. You going to Winco? Go make disciples there. You go into the human solution shelter? Go make disciples there. Wherever you go, go make disciples and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We've been commissioned by God to go. And you know, the most important part of this service is in just a few moments. When I pray for you and I send you out to go live contagious life. You know, the devil, quite frankly, he doesn't care what happens in here as long as you don't take it out there. The most most important part of this service is what happens when we leave this place. He didn't say, world, go to the church. He said, church, go to the world. He says, you're the salt. Salt only works when what? It's being poured out of the salt shaker. And you are the salt of the earth. And when you go out of this place, let your life begin to spice up and season this world so that they can begin to taste and see that the Lord is good through the life you live before them. Amen? Can we give the Lord an applause for a moment? You know, for some of you, well, actually for all of us, if you have a job, you know, when you go to work, uh, when you go to the store, when you go to the athletic club, everywhere you're going, you're entering the harvest field. And you understand how important it is that you get harvesters overlapping with the harvest field. What would happen if all the harvesters isolated from the field? What's going to happen to that field? (laughs) It's going to self-destruct. You know, this harvest won't self-reap, but it will self-destruct. Now, in the Bible, it says that Jesus, that he was filled with the Spirit, that he was led by the Spirit, that he moved by the power of the Spirit. Do you remember me talking with you about that? And that he wants that for us, that we would be Spirit-filled, led, and empowered people. And then, uh, so the question is, what should Christians who have been filled, led, and are moving in the power of the Spirit be doing? What should we do? Should we just sit around in church all day long and enjoy what it feels like to be filled and led and empowered? Or should we take that out there? Listen to what Jesus said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He's anointed me. For what? Would you read the underlines? To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In essence, the Great Commission, when Jesus said, go, In essence, what he was saying was, go and do this. 
Go and do this stuff. That everywhere you go, your life is preaching the good news. That because of what Jesus did on the cross, our sins can be forgiven. And we can be walking in relationship with God. That everywhere we go, our testimony, our lives, our message should be proclaiming the good news. That you can tell the addict. You can tell the person that's stuck and they're imprisoned by their life. You can tell them, you can be free. You can be free because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He talked about uh, recovery of sight uh, for the blind. Everywhere we go, we have been commissioned to carry the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that He comes to heal us physically, emotionally, mentally, and most important, spiritually? And then He talks about to release the oppressed. How many of you know in this world, people can feel very oppressed and depressed and just kind of pushed into a dark place? And God has, wants His church to proclaim a message. Listen, Jesus' light can penetrate right where you are and push that oppression and depression right out the back door. That's the message we've been commissioned to carry. Amen? And then He talked about to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. Let me hear you say, Lord's favor. And i got to tell you something. There are a lot, and pardon me for using a little bit of crass language, but this mindset frustrates me enough that I'm going to risk being a bit crass this morning. Is that okay? Way too many Christians are putting out the vibe and the message that somehow God is pissed off with everybody. It's true. Uh, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You better be careful, little ears, what you hear. Because you hear the wrong thing, man, and God is pissed off with you. Who wants to worship a God that's pissed off at him? I know I don't. And somewhere along the line, he's saying, you missed a very sweet part of this apostolic commission that you are here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. And I told you guys, remember that? Every 50 years. This is a direct direct association to the year of Jubilee, which in Jewish history, every 50 years was the year of Jubilee. If you were a slave, you were set free. If you had debt, it was canceled. If somehow you'd lost land in a bad deal, that land was restored to you. How many of you know the year of Jubilee was a big year to look forward to? And what he said, what he's saying is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor, what he was saying is you have now, because of Christ, been ushered into a perpetual continuous jubilee. That if you've been a slave and a prisoner to sin, you are free. If, If you've racked up a sin debt, it will be canceled. If you've lost land of your life that's been ravaged from sin, I restore it all back to you. And you don't have to wait for 50 years for that to happen. We are now living in a perpetual season of God's favor. How many of you know people need to hear that message? Not how mad God is at them, but how outrageously in love God is with them. Hallelujah. Now to do the same ministry, and we talked about this. To do the same ministry, we need the same spirit. Acts 1.8. Put it up here. Read it with me. You will receive... What power? You study that and you find out it's the exact same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's some pretty powerful power. (laughs) And he says, you will receive power when my spirit comes upon you. You'll be my power to be a witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Amen? Hallelujah. We need the same spirit. Lord, 
Could you all raise your hands with me right now? God, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit on us because you have given us an audacious assignment. You commissioned us to go and do your ministry. Proclaim the good news. Recovery of sight, your healing ministry to proclaim freedom for prisoners, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And God, if we have any chance at all to carry out that ministry, we need the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to fill our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Give the Lord a thunderous applause. You know, I... uh, we're going to actually go whitewater rafting. Um, my family is, family and some friends, we're going to be going. And uh, What you'll notice is there, there are trained guides. guides. They go to guide school, and they learn how to get a swimmer out of the river. They learn how to throw this rope. They learn, um, you know, how to perform, you know, uh, first aid, different things. They learn a lot at guide school. And can I just tell you, If somebody is floating down a river and they've been separated from their boat and they need help, you don't have to go to guide school. You don't have to know all of that stuff to rescue them. All you got to do is say, hand me the rope and throw it to somebody. It don't take rocket science to throw somebody a rope for Pete's sake. And you know, one of the things that this passage says to us is that, um, that the evangelist's job, somebody who's gifted with evangelism, they're not the only guy out there throwing the rope. But they want to help you understand, hey, you can grab one and throw one too. Amen? I'm not the only one out here rescuing, you know, bringing people into relationship with Christ. You can do that too. And you know, evangelism flows out of a passion for what he's passionate about. But you know what? If you don't care, if you don't care, you'll just let people float right on by. You'll be holding the rope saying, praise God, I'm going to heaven. While people are floating right by who are not going to heaven. And you'll smile and wave and say, have a great day. But if you don't have a passion for what he's passionate about, you'll just let him go right by. But you know, one of the things I've discovered is you don't have to drum up passion. That's not something you just kind of work yourself up into getting. But what happens is you walk in relationship with him, you'll start to catch his passion. Look what it says in Luke. It says, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. It was his passion that moved him. And you know, as you walk into deeper relationship with him, you'll have that passion too. Look what it said here. We've been looking at this verse. Go ahead and go to the next one. Lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. They are white, ready to harvest. They're white. You know, you talk to a farmer that works with this grain or this type of field, they'll tell you, wait a minute, when it's white, that's overripe. Golden brown is ready for harvest. When it's white, that's a harvest that's about ready to be lost. Do you remember when we talked about this verse? Who was here that week? You guys remember me talking about where he said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the field. And another way we can say Lord of the harvest is what? That he's the boss of the harvest. Now listen, if you're the boss of the harvest, And you look out and you see a field over here. And gee, there's people working that one. That's being harvested. That's going well. You look over at this field and there's harvesters there. And uh, that one's being harvested. And then you look out over here. And here's a field that's now white. And you go, wait a minute. There's nobody working that field. Now, if you're the boss, what are you going to do? You're going to start to move and shuffle workers. From a place where you, you know the harvest may not be quite as ripe. And there may be some abundance of workers. And he'll begin to move those workers to the place where the field is ready to be lost. And I began thinking about that. Roger, 
You drive past 10 different harvest fields when you come here. Do you know why? Because the boss of the harvest saw this field and said, Roger, this is where I need you. And some of you, you, and by the way, Cerise, you too. Thank you, Roger and Cerise, for bringing that bread. Amen. And many of you, you drive past other harvest fields, other areas, other communities, and you come and work this field. Why? Because the boss of the harvest put it in our heart. We lifted up our eyes and we looked and we said, this, this field is white. It's ready to be lost. And he put it in our hearts to come here and begin to gather people to himself. Amen. Then I said something really radical. I said, some of you are living in the human solutions, homeless shelter. And you don't like to tell people about that because it seems embarrassing. But if you understand with maybe a little bit of eternal perspective for a moment, how many of you believe there, you know, when God's leading your life, there's, there's no accidents there, right? You guys believe that? Some of you are living there because that field is way white. And God needed to implant harvesters right in the middle of it. And right now you are sleeping, breathing, living in that field. And when you understand that, rather than disdain it and complain and grumble about it, you can begin to recognize, God, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be in this shelter. I hope it's a short season. But while I'm there, I want to recognize that you, the Lord of the harvest, you have, you have me in this place now. And I want to be a good steward of gathering this harvest while I'm here. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and give the Lord applause for that one. We talked about how, you know, throwing the rope really involves really throwing out your story. And that your story has three main components to it. If you've said yes to Christ, your story has three, com uh, three elements. You have your story before you knew Jesus, right? Yep. You remember that one? Kind of painful. And we kind of dumb it down a little bit. Listen, tell your real story. Don't, don't tell the PG version of your story. Tell the real story. Because most people are living their story right now. And your story gives them help. I mean hope. Okay? And so your story has your life before Christ. And then the second part is, how did you come to know Jesus? What were the circumstances? How did you say yes to Christ? And then there's the third part of your story, which is your life since that time. What difference has he made in your life? Now, in, in a good kind of glossed over church, when we get to that point, we just start telling people how perfect our life is. And now, since I've asked Jesus in my life, I've never had another problem. I've never sinned. It's perfect. And everybody looks at you like, what planet are you from? And I think sometimes Jesus is probably going, what? <laughs> You don't have to tell, gee, my life is now perfect. I never sin. I never have any struggles. But how many of you know there's a real story that he has made a difference and he's making a difference in your life? People need to hear that story. Amen. That offers hope. Now, not everybody in this room is an evangelist, but everyone in this room can be evangelistic. Everyone in this room may not be a trained river guide, but you can all grab a rope and throw it to somebody that needs one. Amen? And then I told the story here of the angel that comes to God. And God says to the angel, he says, you know, my plan is I'm going to give the good news. The good news that sins can be forgiven and relationship with God can be restored. I'm going to give that to my kids and I want them to take that to everyone. 
starting first with the people close to them, and then take it to the ends of the earth. And the angel says, well, that sounds like a pretty good plan. But suppose they don't do that. What's plan B? And God says, I don't have a plan B. You're God's plan A. His church has always been his only plan for reaching this world for him. Amen? Somebody once said that, we're, uh, that, that, that the gospel message is always one generation away from extinction. This is our time. There's great stories of people that have thrown that rope in the history, but this is our time. This is our time to step up, not shrink back. This is our time to be bold. This is our time to be assertive. This is our time to be consumed with what consumes him, that we would have his passion and his compassion. How many of you know with compassion, you don't just see the need, you act upon that need, amen? And then the last thing we talked about, and this was last week, is that God's called every one of us to be a pastor to others or to care for others. You know, when your kids came into the world, they couldn't do anything for themselves. They couldn't feed themselves, clothe themselves. They couldn't care for themselves. And you know, a big part of parenting and a big part of pastoring is really... It's really fighting for those that are unable to fight for themselves. That's what Jesus did for us. It said while we were powerless in our sins, Christ died for us. I asked you last week, what does it mean to be a pastor? And you talked, you said things like it means, you know, feeding the sheep. That's true. Caring for the flock. Yes, that's true. Loving the people. Yep, that's true. And to be quite frank with you, I'm still figuring out what that even looks like. But then I started reading these verses that are for all believers. Where he said, would you read them with me? Love one another. Serve one another in love. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Encourage one another. And build each other up. And I began to realize the biggest part of my job is to just keep getting to Jesus, who's the good shepherd, and learn everything I can about what shepherding looks like by looking to him. And then if there's anything I can do is impart that to you. Say, now there's people in your life. There's your kids. There's your neighbors. There's your coworkers. Let's do this stuff. Now, when we've done that, we have greatly mobilized and multiplied the capacity of what a church can do. Amen. We belong to each other. And there have been way too many people that have self-destructed by careening off course into their life of sin. Way too many people that never achieved their dreams or their potential. Way too many people that never achieved greater things. Because somebody sat back and thought, it's none of my business. It's their life. Not in the church. Your life belongs to me. And my life belongs to you. And if, God forbid, if I'm ever careening off course, somebody in here would have enough tenacity to say, Pastor, get back on track with Jesus. Because I belong to you, and you belong to me. Amen? We belong to one another. You know, last week we learned something pretty profound. That sometimes the most loving thing you could ever do is to tell somebody no. That's hard, isn't it? When your kid is saying, my phone shut off. It's the most important thing that I get it back on. Will you help me? And you've helped them how many times? And you've helped them with this, and you've helped them with that, and you've helped them with that. And sometimes a good answer is, I'm not going to this time. And it isn't because I don't love you. It's because I do love you. 
And as long as we shield and protect our kids or the people around, as long as we're shielding and protecting everybody from the natural consequences of the life they've chosen, then they will continue in that life. But as soon as you say, I'm going to let you experience some of the consequences of the choices you've made. Now all of a sudden, there's some pain being felt. How many of you know pain it has a, a way of getting your attention, right? Pain has a way of getting your attention. And when we stop enabling people, what happens now is the pain is finally caught up to them. And in recovery groups, they talk about hitting, help me out, they talk about hitting what? Rock bottom. Where finally their pain caught up to them and they figured out, I got to change something in my life. In essence, that's the story of the prodigal son. You guys remember that? He, he took his entire inheritance and he went to a foreign land. It says he blew it all on prostitutes and wine and unrighteous living. He blew it all. Now here he is, a Jewish boy, which growing up you know, in the Jewish community, you did, pigs were, you know, you did not mess with a pig, right? Now here he is, feeding pigs. In this foreign land. And he was so hungry and so at the end of himself, so at that rock bottom place, it says he longed to fill his stomach with what he was feeding to the pigs. The slop. The pig slop. And it says right there, and he came to his senses. Right there. He came to his senses. And he turned his eyes towards home. And he figured out, how many of my father's hired hands have it better than I do? I will come and I will throw my life at my father's feet. And you guys know the story. The father was so full of grace and mercy. He saw his son coming from a long ways off. And he ran to his son. Now, he was not rescuing his son. But when he saw his son repent and be returning home, that father ran out to meet him clothed him, killed the fatted, you know, lamb, and had a party, had a celebration. And I got to tell you something, how often we get this misconstrued idea of who God is. I'm coming back now again to these people that somehow have this idea that God's like this and he's mad at all of you. You guys remember how the older brother responded when the younger brother returned home? after blowing it all. And he sees his father putting sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger and a coat on his back and throwing a feast. And you remember what that older brother said? How dare you? I've been slaving for you all these years. And I've demanded nothing. And now this son of yours goes and blows it all on women and alcohol, and unrighteously. He comes back and you throw a party. I've been slaving for you all these years. And you know, some people have this notion that God the Father is one that we're to be slaving for. How many of you know if that's your picture of God, that your life amounts to nothing more than slaving for this taskmaster, that will turn you into a very angry Christian. And yet somewhere the younger son had caught enough about the father that he knew he was a safe place to come back to. And I want you to know, no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've done, your father, he is not angry at you. He loves you. There are times he's grieved. The grieving is because it hurts a parent's heart to see their kids struggle and turmoil and pain. That grieves a parent's heart. But like a good parent, God will allow you to be in that place because that's where we finally, like the prodigal son, come to our senses and we can turn our hearts back to him and find his grace afresh and new. Amen? 
you know, the most caring thing you can ever do is point someone to Jesus. I want to encourage you, if anything I said today, you'd like to hear more of it, go to YouTube and look for this series, this fivefold living. All the teachings are there. And I think there's a lot to, to garner out of that. Amen? So fivefold living in a nutshell is this. Is that God has called every one of us to be a prophetic people. That we'd be walking in such a relationship with God that we'd be able to discern and hear from him. Amen? That he's commissioned every one of us to go. To go. We've been apostolically commissioned to carry the ministry of Christ. He delegates us to carry his, his, his ministry. He wants our life and our message to point people to him. And he wants us to care deeply for the people he's put around our lives. If you want to call it pastoring, pastoring those people, whatever you want to do, if we kind of take religious lingo out of it, essentially what he's saying is, I want you to love and care for those people. Because when you do that, you're showing them what the good shepherd looks like. Amen? Let's bow our heads together. And this morning as I've preached, your heart is being moved. And you realize, I need a relationship with God. I'm the prodigal son. That's my story right now. That's where I'm at. And in your pain, you finally are coming to the place where you're turning your eyes to him. And if that's you, if you'd like to say yes to Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross so that you could walk in relationship with a loving father, you could walk in relationship with God. If that's you, you've never asked him into your life or maybe you have at some point, but you've wandered off and today you're recommitting yourself. If that's you, would you throw your hand in the air where you're at? You're committing or recommitting to the Lord. Raise it up high if that's you. Amen. I see your hand and I see yours. I see yours right over here. Anybody else this morning? Just raise it up where you're at. If that's you. Can we pray together? Dear Lord, I say yes. I say yes to what you did on that cross. You paid for my sin. I receive it. Wash my heart clean. Fill me with your spirit. And help me live for you. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.